the first crack cast news of the summertime, officially of the summertime. It was a long day yesterday, wasn't it? Very gosh? long, yeah. yeah. The longest, actually, Indeed. of the year, yes. yes. Very uh, solstice. Summertime. Uh, welcome back to the news. Uh, I'm John. There's Josh. Dr. Mike is here. Dave Hello. is out this week. So uh, fewer interruptions Shouldering this week. some extra yeah. responsibilities. Yes, he's a little dislocated this week, I think, yes. So uh, maybe we'll all be able to complete a sentence this week without Dave here. Sorry, we love you, Dave, but uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, oh, before we jump into uh, this week's news, quick update on something we talked about last week with some actually breaking news just in the last couple of hours before we started recording. Uh, Dr. Mike is on the subject of the uh, kind of sort of Olympics maybe possibly coming to Krakow. Yeah, it's basically it's the European Olympics, so like the Olympics special little brother, I guess. Uh, and it was a unanimous vote today in Minsk. Uh, all the Olympic committees in Europe decided to uh, choose Krakow and Mal the Małopolska region uh, to host the next 2023 European Olympics. And this came as a bit of a surprise to uh, the mayor of Krakow, actually. Yeah, he's, he's, he's either really incompetent, an idiot, or just a goddamn liar, because he, he's saying like, no... Ooh, harsh words. Oh, you know, the truth hurts. Uh, but what's hilarious is, he's, he, first of all, he says he didn't know anything about this, but then he also signed a letter of intent and readiness for the city back at the end of May in Rome. Uh, but then he says, like, only, he only signed that if he would get assurances that the uh, national government would, uh, you know, shoulder the financial burden of this. So it's like conditional. We're, we're, we're happy to get the Olympics if Warsaw will pay for it. Exactly. He's saying it's conditional, but there was nothing, like, written down in the sense of that condition. He just basically said this. He said this uh, on that paper that he signed in Rome that, no, the city is ready for this. It's, I guess the conditions were... Uh, uh, You're saying that this verbal agreement is not worth the paper. It was <laughs> not, not written on it. Uh, and now he's saying that if he doesn't get any paperwork saying that the national government will support that, he's going to deny or say no to the Olympics. Reject it. Yeah, and, w w and what I was about to say I is like, yes, it was a unanimous vote for Krakow and Małopolska, but there were no other cities or regions that actually <laughs> were in the bid. So, you know. We came like, in first place out of a field of one. That's a glorious revolution type election, isn't it? That also means you're last, in a way. And so just in the last couple of hours, again, before we started recording today, we learned that it's all official, basically. The ball is kind of pushed a little further along the path. And at this point, wouldn't it be completely humiliating for Krakow to, to kind of not host it? I mean, it was embarrassing before, but at this point, they're kind of obligated to, to take what's been handed to them, aren't they? But nobody wanted this. Nobody said it was a good idea. So I am, wouldn't be surprised if the first day of next week, uh, you know, protest groups show up and register their uh, anti-Olympic uh, NGOs to stop the Olympics from happening in how Krakow. Could, how could you possibly be anti-Olympic? I mean, it's everything that's good and noble about the, the you know, the human endeavor, uh, isn't it? Not so much. Yeah. Uh, maybe if you like like having uh, politicians pay for cr uh, crack and hookers well, you know, and stuff like that. This is just four years from now, and four years is not a long time, especially in the world of you know Polish bureaucracy. When you think about the facilities, the, the stadiums and the arenas and all the things that are needed for this, wh where are these events going to be held exactly? We have, okay, we have the arena here, we have, a, we have a, a couple of stadiums, but for the track and field events, for the various other things that are part of the, the European Olympics, where are they going to do this? And again, as you said, it's not just Krakow, it's Małopolska, which kind of implies that other cities in the region are supposed to host things. Well, I think well. Bonia is perfectly shaped for the hammer throw, so that's taken, <laughs> taken care of. But what's hilarious is they don't even know what sports, what disciplines will be uh, happening in those four years because it, it, it's they don't know what sports how many people how much it's going to cost yeah you get the feeling somebody in the krakow government in the last few days was frantically searching wikipedia to learn something about the european olympics like what the hell is this that we're supposed to host and it's like we mentioned last week and on wikipedia it already said like a few weeks ago that krakow would be hosting yeah, before krakow right. even knew it what is this egg and spoon race they are speaking of <laughs> three-legged race yeah well i think we mentioned Potato last sack. week that uh, the whole drama and the comedy around the uh, europe the uh, european olympics is going to provide us with a lot of uh laughs be a lot of fun uh, over the next year. few years so we're looking forward to it so we'll see how that turns out but as things stand now we are going to be the host of this uh, kind of sort of big event maybe not really a big event but yes it's like Krakow Poland is hosting the next ones while the ones happening in Minsk right now nobody's even knows it's happening it's not on the news it's I'll not on you, TV I bet you Eurosport isn't even broadcasting well, it's a bit this unfortunate stuff. because it's coinciding with the Women's World Football Club, Cup which has obviously been completely oh, dominated the, yeah, the, the sports world yes. things, it's like it's, it's a competition of what I don't care about less it's brought to you by the BBC I think <laughs> Right. Well, moving on to uh, our news this week, let's start with um, something that's actually going on about 100 meters away from where we are sitting right now at Crackhouse World Headquarters. Uh, you probably know that there's a huge renovation project going on on Dietla Street and Krakowska Street, all, actually all over the city, but one of the bigger projects is here at the corner of Dietla and Krakowska. And last week, 
uh, the construction crews, while kind of digging around and doing what they're doing at the corner of, uh, you know, where, where Stratum, Dietla, Krakowska come together, they found what is apparently uh, remains or pieces of the original bridge called the Royal Bridge that spanned from, you know, what is today Stratum over what is today Dietla to uh, Krakowska Street. We should but, remind people that there used to be a river here on Dietla. Is this, in, this isn't some kind of Polish joke yeah, where they built a bridge <laughs> where there wasn't a river. Like If you're listening and you don't know this, uh, sunglasses Dietla, or something. what is today Dietla, used to be a branch of the river until the, like, I think the 1880s. Yeah, not and that long ago. It's surprising. I mean, the it, railway was built over the, the yeah, river. It's not that yeah. long ago at all. And yeah. it follows Dietla to more or less Holotar- where uh, Holotargova is, and then it follows what's it called, Dashenskiego, yeah. past Galeria Kazimierz, and the river rejoined the river, sorry, the, the, the branch of the river Basically, rejoined the Basically, if you see dual carriageway yeah. in the center of Krakow, it used Pretty to be much. a river, yeah. And so, Krak- uh, sorry, Kazimierz, rather, was an island. It was an island separated from the rest of the, of the city by the river. In the 1870s, 1880s, the branch uh, dried up. And the Austrians, who were occupying Krakow at the time, they filled it in, turned it into the streets and whatnot. And so uh, for 600 years or so before this, the, um, the, uh, the Dietla Street was established, there was a bridge, again, from present-day Stratum to present-day Krakowska. And again, last week, they found the remnants of the bridge, uh, further complicating what was already a big mess. I guess the work is coming to a halt or slowed down at, the, at a minimum to allow, to allow archaeologists to go and do what they do. Uh, guys, what are you supposed to do when you find the remnants of an old bridge uh, three or four meters under a street? I would pretend not to see it, basically, because it's like, <laughs> not so hard in my case, but uh, it's like, you know what's happening. They have to bring in experts, scientists, archaeologists, and it was under the ground for 300 years or whatever. Nobody no- m- m- missed it while it was gone. Uh, and this just means they're saying that it's going to take about a month or two to excavate and look at it, and it's not going to cut into the schedule. And it's not going to no, not at all. anything. Sure, not at all. Uh, I doubt it. I'm sure they'll figure out a way to make life more miserable for everybody. It might even make things faster, mm-hmm. sure. Well, you kind of have the feeling that when, um, you know, the eponymous Yusuf Dietl was kind of in, in, enacting all his plans to, to cover over what remained of the river and uh, create this marvellous boulevard. Dietl, who was the, the mayor of Krakow for a long uh, time. Yeah, before. yeah, yeah. A very long time. But a long time ago, obviously, before the current incumbent. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he might well have seen this old bridge and was like, kind of, yeah, maybe, no, 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 no let's cover it with concrete. And then, you know, nobody will know any of the better. They didn't have such an appreciation for uh, historical artifacts, maybe. For them, it was just an old bridge that was in the way, I guess, right? Right, yeah. Different mentality for this kind of thing? Oh, those poor bastards back then. They don't just... They didn't yeah, do but you can imagine a scenario 500 years from now when they uncover some kind of like ancient concrete high-rise building and they say, those barbarians in the uh, you know <laughs> 21st century just knocking these things down and... I, I, I hope they don't say that about Fordham, though. I hope Fordham's gone by 500 years from but now. For, with I'd this be bridge, for our generation. For this bridge, what are they supposed to do? They're not going to, you know, remove it somehow and put it in a museum. No, they're going to study it, take photographs, and they're probably going to, like, fill it up with dirt again in, in a sense of a time caps or something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, the, uh, the mess connected with Dietla and the uncovered bridge... It's Actually, sorry, John, to interrupt, yeah. to, to be fair. You know, Even being, though Dave is in here, Josh, yeah, yeah. Josh will take the position I'm, of Dave today. <laughs> Interrupting exercising, exercising that privilege. But yes. being situated as I am so close to the uh, location in question, I can say quite categorically that there has been considerably more activity around that particular patch than there has been for the last uh, few weeks. What do you mean, like uh, people coming in to take a look or like official looking people? Uh, or uh, like, like, lots of people, machinery moving oh. backwards and forwards. Um, uh, yeah, loud noises, things being carried, things Have being dropped. Have you seen dropped. any parts? Because I passed by there on my way here earlier. I didn't see any kind of uh, place that looked like it was especially deep, you know, like a, a, a deep hole. I was, that's what I was looking for, because apparently it's like four meters under the street level. And I didn't see anything like that. Oh, I haven't seen something that deep. I've seen stuff like kind of approaching two meters deep. Mm. But I don't know that I would recognize what an old bridge's foundations would look like anyway. It would look like rocks and gravel. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's part of a larger situation, a larger larger, uh, um, problem, really, that's affecting the whole city. Uh, Public transport is a mess, not only because of the construction going on everywhere, but also, Dr. Mike, uh, it kind of happens to coincide, unfortunately, with some changes in the scheduling that make our lives even more difficult if you depend on public transport to get around. Yeah, this is something I love about every summer, and a lot of people might not have even realized it. Is that sarcasm? A a tad, just a twinge. Yeah, I just threw it in there for a little spice in our lives. Uh... Thursday was Corpus Christi, so a lot of people had the day off. And then, you know, you go Friday morning, you wake up to go to work, and you all of a sudden realize that, that, that you missed your tram or it's not coming. Well, on Friday, that one day, they decided to start the uh, summer vacation scheduling for public transit in the city, which means they get rid of a lot of bus and tram lines and stuff runs less frequently because, you know, high school kids and 
uh, college students aren't going to classes anymore, but you know the rest of us going to work still kind of get used to those trams at those certain times, and all of a sudden they're gone now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it's the same with uh, when it comes to the rail network, uh, the national rail network trains. And can be organized to kind of take people north to the Baltic, I think. Yeah, and there's, and, there's, and there's also like less frequent connections between major metropolitan areas because, oh, it's summer, so people aren't working for the next three months, apparently. Yeah, so if you were waiting for your, uh, your bus or your... Tr- especially, I think more bus lines were liquidated than tram lines. I think everything, all the bus lines starting with a seven kind of disappeared last week. I mean, I can kind and of understand the logic because let's, it is true that Krakow has hundreds of thousands of students uh, and uh, and school kids that stop needing the uh, services uh, during this time of year, but at least wait until like the beginning of July or something. Don't start in the middle of the week right after day off when people that are still normally weird, working. It? It's like wait at least till till Monday or make it always the first Monday of July or something like that. And it's I I only I don't usually have to take a tram to work, but sometimes I do like run out late and oh I'll take the tram and all of a sudden instead of having one every three minutes I have to wait twelve minutes. Wasn't it that they've enrolled all the drivers in this special air conditioning awareness course? So, uh, <laughs> over the summer, yeah. <laughs> They'll be well, ready between, by September. Between the summertime schedule and the construction on Dietla and the construction on Krakowska and the construction on Matechne, which is a big problem affecting the tram traffic. Uh, we might be better off just walking everywhere for the next three or four months, I think. Or taking a scooter. Taking, oh, no, don't get me started on the scooters. Yeah, maybe. Well, moving on from public transport, uh, let's talk about a completely different subject. You may or may not know that about a month ago, I think just over three weeks ago, uh, at the hospital in Prokochim, a children's hospital in Prokochim, uh, Krakow welcomed, actually Poland welcomed its first ever recorded set of septuplets. That's six babies born no, together. You said septuplets. That's seven. Sextuplets. That's better. I was checking up. Well, the parents already attention. had Sorry. one kid as well. So, so, so they have sep children. I guess. forgot <laughs> the one in the chamber. <laughs> Sorry. Sextuplets. Six kids. You're right. Sep, sep, sep is seven, isn't it? Okay, anyway. <laughs> let me do that again. Sextuplets. Six babies born together. Right. Uh, John, once again, sexing up the news. <laughs> thankfully, yes. Thankfully, they're all uh, healthy and doing well. And uh, uh, even though they have to spend the next couple of months in the hospital, you know, of course, um, as is common in the situation that the Babies are quite small, and so uh, they have to stay in the hospital longer than, than uh, the parents would like them to. But it was interesting, not only because there were six babies born together. I mean, how often does that happen? That's a big deal. Again, first time ever recorded in Polish history. But a couple of things that happened since then that are starting to lead to kind of sort of a little bit of controversy, even though maybe it's not uh, very nice to kind of notice these things. But that's what we do at the Crack House. We, we go where others fear to tread, right? Well, here's the, here's the deal. Okay. Well, with the, with the government's 500 plus program, the family is automatically going to get 3,500 zwaris a month from now on, right? Because they have uh, seven kids. They had one kid previously. Now six more makes seven times 500. So they get 3,500 a month. That's a pretty good income for, I mean, not going to get rich, obviously, but it's, you know, it's pretty decent compared to the national it helps, yeah. average salary. On top of that, <clears throat> the local government gave them a, a car. I'm not sure exactly what model car, kind of like a minivan kind of thing, kind of help them trans... I, it's still probably too small for six kids. You need kids, a pickup truck for Christ's sake. You need a, an eighteen wheeler to. But uh, so they got a free car from the city government. Um, the local government also gave them a place to stay, like access to a government-owned apartment that's near the hospital, because as I mentioned, the babies have to stay there for another couple of months, and so they want the parents to be able to stay nearby. So that's nice. And then on top of all that. Uh, just last week, we learned that the government, I'm not sure if it's the city government, the provincial government maybe, gave them 100,000 zwaris, like a, just a gift, uh, 100,000 zwaris in cash. So they got the place to stay. They got uh, the car. They got 100,000 zwaris. They've got this uh, 3,500 zwaris a month from the, the 500 plus program. At what point are we allowed to ask if they got enough? Uh, I, I, I see where you're going with this, and I generally do agree, because I do like it when society helps families. Absolutely. I'm all for that. Uh, but I definitely am I'm not comfortable with like the 500-plus program, stuff like that. I think instead of you know giving cash, just have tax credits and deductions from uh, what you're earning. And not because, you know, for every 500 results they get in uh, cash, the taxpayers have to pay, you know, an extra 50 percent overhead on that just for the administrative cost. So, you know, they've got 100,000 here, this 3,500 a month. This, this country has to pay a lot more for that. Uh, I am completely okay with like private companies using these kids for advertising if the parents want oh, to. We're so, going to get know. to that in a minute. I'm sh- yeah, uh, that, that'll be but, an issue you know, in the, the next few years, I'm sure. The city, up until you start talking about like the actual car and the cash, 
I was okay. But with the car and the cash, it's like, eh, you know, give them free bus rides. What about people who have twins? Should they get one third as much? Should they get uh, 33,000 Zwadis free from the government for having or twins? Or what do you have like twins, you know, three sets of twins or something like that? So, yeah. Well, Josh, I mean, okay, yeah, this, this is, uh, I mean, because this, this, this is kind of. You know, I think this is true in the States as well. I mean, but I mean, if basically, if you had triplets, you never had to pay for disposable nappies because the company is going to, like, you know, want the, the little, sure. little brat's face. Sponsorship. Yeah. Sponsorship. So if you've got six of the bastards, then, uh, or no, I shouldn't say that. I mean, cute little they're kids. They're married, so they're not cute bastard little brat. kids. Oh, they are Polish, I'm presuming. Otherwise, this wouldn't be accepted quite so. Oh, getting into deeper water there, aren't you? Yeah. All, all right. right. Back, on, back on. on track. Back on track. Oh, that was the end. I thought you. <laughs> I thought you were just getting started. Yeah, Sorry. I was back on track, but end of the line. <laughs> wow, talk about dead air. Wow, geez. Uh, so, but g- give give me the executive summary of your take on what the what the kids of uh, the family has uh, received so far. Uh, so three thousand five hundred a month in five hundred plus payments because they're seven children. In yeah, total. but you're okay with this? The hundred thousand and the car and the place to live and the monthly payments. Well, no, but I mean, the place to live is a temporary thing while the kids yeah. are in hospital. So it's yeah. that's I think you, you know you're you're possibly um, kind of leaning on the scales a little bit there. I mean, if it's basically a, a kind of a grace and favorite apartment for for a couple of months or so, I don't see anything particularly unreasonable. Okay, about that. but wait a second. Again, I'm playing devil's advocate here. That's what I do. Uh, this hospital in Pocotchim. You know, they, they help some kids who are in really, you know, it's a horrible thing. Mm. Kids in really desperate um, situations, health-wise, really terrible, terrible things they have to deal with. And th- the parents of those kids have to come from all over the region, maybe all over the country. They need a place to stay as well. Why doesn't the government step in and give them a free place well, to stay? Well, actually, the hospital there has built up uh, infrastructure to f- yeah, for a place to stay yeah. very close. And I think they've also, like... Uh, I'm talking I, about the Ronald McDonald House? That's part of it. That's it. Uh, but they also... <laughs> State provided, then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they've, uh, well, you know, that's, you know, a private charity doing what a private charity does best. And I think that's, the, you know, the proper Absolutely. place for it. Yeah. Uh, but they've also, like, uh, had rooms and stuff available because you have to remember, like, just 20 years ago, it wasn't the norm for parents to stay near sick kids. It was completely, you know, you'd visit your kid for an hour or two a day and the hospital would kick you out, especially. Uh, that's Poland. horrible. Uh, and, you know, it just became kind of like in the late 90s and the 2000s, normal for parents to stay there a whole day or to be able to spend the night with six kids sick kids, which you would think is normal. It's like you have a six-year-old with lymphoma yeah. you know, in a hospital and scared. I think it's completely appropriate for at least one parent to be there. Uh, so, you know, the infrastructure is built up for that. And I generally, you know, with these kids, they're premature, which is normal when you have uh, multiple birth. It will be basically, you know, kids, when it's multiple birth, they are born early. And the time that they would usually spend in utero has to be kept in incubators and uh, uh, and monitored. So it's going to be a couple of weeks, a couple of months before they can go home. I'm all f- uh, fine with the parents being allowed to stay close by and, uh, and help and the state helping out with that. Well, we've got our fingers crossed for these kids for sure. And we look forward to the day when they can all go home. Uh, when they can all come on the crack cast and tell us yeah, about exactly. their get collective s- experience. Get some more microphones in here, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Sponsorship. But, but, but joking aside, aren't seriously, in a year or two or three, are we going to see these kids all over Polish television? I think we are. It, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely have like an Instagram story or something like that going on. You know? <laughs> if they go to be tall, they'll be a volleyball team. I they? think I mean, uh, some company that makes baby food or clothes for babies or just general baby stuff. I mean, how could they not want to sign this family up to be uh, to be in the advertisement? I see a sitcom sense. happening soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if it gets uh, you know the the the, 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 the the usual suspects of the advertising hoardings, it doesn't seem to be very one dimensional sometimes. I do I do kind of feel sorry for their first kid, their older kid. It's like ah, two year yes. old. It's like nobody's going to know that family because of that one kid. It's like always going to be his like younger uh, siblings. It's like it? the male core brother, isn't it? From the cores, nobody mm. knows what he looks like. Well, speaking of kids, and speaking of lots of kids and uh, health issues, uh, for this next subject, uh, we're going to rely a little bit on Dr. Mike's uh, status as a doctor. Remember, remember, unbelievably, he is an actual doctor. Uh, we're talking about vaccinations. Dr. Mike, there's a story this week about how the city government is trying to uh, encourage rather forcefully people to get uh, vaccinated by giving them, giving them some incentives related to uh, admission to city run preschools. Uh, it's not even preschools. It's just the nurseries, actually. So, like, you know, where you drop off your kid if it's well, just back in Polish. Yeah, it's like, you know, a year old or something like that and, and daycare centers. And there's limited spots in that. So, you know, we have X amount of kids born in the city, but only have, say, half X available spots. And you know, there are private daycare centers, but these are the state-sponsored ones. 
And to get into them, you have to, you know, apply. And depending on whether or not you're working, how much you're earning, uh, your family situation, you get a different amount of points. And, you know, the people with the most points get awarded that spot to drop off their kid there for free. Uh, the councilmen have suggested, and this pretty much is going to go through, that as their vaccination status of the children will also be counted towards uh, getting a spot in uh, these daycare centers. And the way it's set up basically is that no unvaccinated children will be able to be left out of these daycare centers, which actually kind of makes sense because if there's any one place where germs get spread around, it's any place that has little kids running oh, around. Sure. So... Um, I know the whole anti-vax and vaccination issue is something that a lot of people debate about. I'm definitely pro-vaccine, and I would always argue that to everybody that unless you have legitimate medical reasons, uh, then your children should be vaccinated. And especially because of those like uh, medical reasons, when somebody can't get vaccinated, they want everybody around them to be vaccinated for the disease not to spread. So <clears throat> for the anti-vaxxers, they might get a uh, bitchy and moany about this, but... For everybody else, I think this this makes sense. This is a, a way the city can promote vaccinations without being too heavy handed. Is there any, in, in your professional medical opinion, is there any argument? Is there anything to put on the side, uh, on on the scale, on the side of the anti vaxxers? Do, do they make any legitimate points at all? Well, <clears throat> this is another thing about anti vaxxers. They're usually thrown into like one group of crackpot conspiracy theories, like oh, it causes autism. It's full of mercury, blah blah blah. No, the, the largest group of anti vaxxers are just people who aren't sure about the vaccines, as in they're afraid it might make their kids sick because of all this. There are side effects, but your chance of getting the side effects are one in X million. But, you know, people read the pamphlet, they get paranoid. They're also not sure where these vaccines are coming from. So when they hear that, oh, this one was made in some province in China they've never heard of, they're worried that it, will be, uh, it won't be safe. So they get a little paranoid. And that's the most people that are the anti-vaxxers aren't actually, actually ex against the vaccinations. They're just not sure that it's 100% safe. Before. Fair questions about the origin of the of the vaccine exactly and that's the most people it's, it's like those are the most uh the largest percentage of people that don't want to get their kids vaccinated or they want to like just wait a while longer the crazy ones that really believe in the whole autism thing and stuff like that are a minor percentage of them they just get blown out of proportion because that's more media interesting how effective do you have a, a number for the uh, if, um uh how, how effective are the vaccines once they're given? In other, in other words, what degree of protection does it give? It really depends on the vaccine and the age, but we're talking you know, upper 90s here. Uh, so, I mean, and, devil's and, advocate question here, if the vaccines are so effective uh, and protects you from the disease, then why are you afraid of being around someone who might have the disease if you're protected against it? Because there's always the chance that you won't be protected because it's there is a chance. And second of all, once you have enough people that aren't vaccinated, the disease can start spreading and start mutating. Plus, you also have to remember that about 5% of the population of children legitimately cannot be vaccinated because of allergies and problems. So they want all the other people around them to be vaccinated because they can't be. But if all of a sudden a few percentage more children aren't vaccinated, they have a higher chance of getting uh, sick. Josh, you have a take I mean, on I, this? Yeah, no, I think, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I broadly agree with what Mike is saying. I, I think that... Um, it may be a question of, of presentation, really, because, I mean, I, although I am thoroughly in favour of, of vaccination and all the benefits that it brings to the, the greater majority, I'm not in favour of, for example, making vaccination compulsory. So I think a situation like this is an effective workaround, but I think you need to present it not so much in, a, uh, in the sense that uh, unless you vaccinate your kid, he or she won't be eligible to attend this school. You should instead switch it so that you will need to be vaccinated to attend here because if you're not vaccinated, there are greater risks because you come into contact with vastly more people that you might pick up something. So then you're actually kind of emphasising the benefits of vaccination and the risks of not being vaccinated. And there have been actually politicians who have also suggested to quell the fears of uh, of some of these anti-vaxxers. They've suggested, like, let's just put a five grosse surcharge on uh, vaccinations, something along those lines, and build up a fund for uh, any child who does get the side effects or does get sick from the, from the vaccination. And the thing is, when you do the math... So much money will be collected that that small potential of people that might potentially get sick will have more than enough money to, you know, pay for all the medical expenses for the rest of their life, which is very unlikely to happen anyway. But just because there's so few people that actually get sick that if you collect a little bit extra money from the, all the people that are getting vaccinated, it would definitely cover the medical cost. Unless you're newly born with five identical siblings, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's vaccinations. 
there are so many studies out there proving that they help. The side effects that do happen, but they are so, so, so rare. When you're getting vaccinated, you're more likely to get sick because, I don't know, the needle breaks and you get a small infection from that. That is statistically probably more likely okay, to be wait, a medical doctor, reason. Since, since you opened the door to this, Dr. Mike, I'm, I'm going to go running through it. And something, <laughs> something that we mentioned before we started recording, I'm curious about this. You mentioned so many uh, studies out there that, that say that the risk is minimal or maybe non-existent. You know, I can say the same thing about genetically modified foods. Every study says, you know, the, the risk is minimal, infinitesimal, almost zero. And yet, especially in Europe, there's a very, very strong segment of the population that is absolutely, you know, Franken foods, all the rest of it. It's not natural, doesn't go in my body. But those people who get the most upset about GMO are typically the same people who point at the anti-vaxxers and laugh about why they don't want it. So, guys, what do you, what do you make of the, what seems to be a real fundamental disconnect here? Monsanto. They're, uh, they're, yeah. they're just they're, yeah. they're evil Nazis, aren't they? Yeah. I just find it hilarious that apparently Bill Nye used to be all like anti-Monsanto until they took him into like a little room and talked with him for a while. <laughs> and now he's, you know... <laughs> No, but seriously, why, 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 are, why are doubts about uh, genetically modified foods taken seriously when, again, there's almost no evidence to support the claims, whereas anti-vaxxers are painted as these ridiculous, superstitious people? Well, well, my I think, sorry, I mean... Yes, who just yeah. can't get along, basically. It's, I mean, my understanding about a lot of the uh, anti-GMO food thing is actually nothing to do with science or health, and it's entirely to do with fears that that uh, corporate entities own copyrights and patents to stuff that... Well, and corporate that. entities don't own vaccines? Well, they, well, these vaccines are, you know, uh, uh, no longer patented or stuff like that. You know, the measles, stuff like that. They bring in new stuff, but just because of how many vaccines they sell, the costs are relatively low. But with GMOs, that is an argument that I think is more interesting because for me, the health impacts of GMO and stuff like that, that's, that's not an issue. The business side of it is something we can discuss, but generally I'm also... The business side of vaccines too. Uh, well, and this is also that can be dis uh, discussed. You know, they're, they're pushing these vaccines, but, you know... There's yeah, well, look, drug patents are like, you know, they only last for 20 years and it can take, you know, there is, it's maybe not f forgivable, but I mean, one of the reasons why like new drugs are very, very expensive is because, you know, re research and development costs and type approval costs are enormous. And so, and then you only have a limited number of years, you know, in the hope that the drug is actually effective to recoup all of those costs. So it is super expensive. And then once it drops out of patent, if it's if it's a if it's a drug that has wide application, then it will be um, produced generically for much much less. And maybe I just don't like the fact that you know, like for example, me, I, I support vaccinations. Yes, I want kids to be vaccinated too, absolutely. But I don't like the fact that in this climate we have today, where if I ask fair questions about. Uh, uh, about um, from the point of view of an anti-vaxxer that I'm painted as this again superstitious hillbilly type who does, does you know who hates science and that's ridiculous you know I think there are fair questions to ask and uh, again comparing it to GMO I think is completely valid because again the same people who are so anti-GMO are pro-vaccine and it seems completely inconsistent to me but. because it's just a trendy thing to be uh, up in arms against and, and I agree with you exactly uh, uh, completely well, thank you Dr. Mike. <laughs> where it, I think it's hilarious that, you know, you just have questions, legitimate questions, which can't be answered. And all of a sudden, but if, but you're painted as a crazy person, uh, you know, you're just trying to be a little more aware. I mean, yeah. you know, and as soon as people start talking about an issue in the media in general, then other people start thinking about it. And, you know, and they, they ask questions as well. And I think we should just approach these people and give them some of the facts, talk to them, you know, calmly and not treat them like idiots or crazy people. And they're more likely to listen to you. I mean, that's a, a huge problem we have in the political crime right now is when people disagree with each other, they paint the other side as being crazy or having no legitimate uh, grounding or uh, rationale for their views instead of just like you know, talking and trying to figure out why we have you know opposing opinions. Let me explain to you why you're crazy <laughs> <laughs> and why you're wrong. Well, I can't think of a segue from vaccines to our next story, so I'll just jump right into the next story. It's about Yagalonian University. Interesting bit of news this week from uh, Business Week. What's it called? Business Insider. Sorry. Business Insider. They ranked somehow, I don't know the methodology they use, but they somehow ranked the universities of the world. And uh, the usual suspects are at the top, Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, Stanford, et cetera, et cetera. And Yagalonian University was Poland's highest ranking entry in the list. And they made the list at number 338. And that is a huge improvement. When I was a student, they were at like 500 something, 600 well, something. Last year, they were 411. How they jumped from 411 to 338 in one year, I don't know. Again, the methodology is kind of a secret, I guess. But uh, what my takeaway from this is something that, um, you know, hard, hard to phrase this properly without stepping on somebody's toes. But, you know, Yagalonian, Yagalonian University. Uh, understandably, you know, very, very renowned, famous in Poland. Everybody in Poland knows Jagiellonian. 
a well-deserved reputation for everything that it does. But outside of Poland, Jagiellonian is is almost on no one's radar. It's completely unknown outside of the Polish community, uh, Polonia and Poland, of course. And uh, this is kind of a uh, kind of a what's the word? Kind of a, a data point that kind of supports the idea that maybe Jagiellonian is not as ad, an elite an institution as maybe some people think. Uh, we should mention, like you were saying, like the mythology mythology of how they came up with this number is a little weird. Because mythology or methodology? <laughs> methodology. <laughs> Maybe there's some mythology too. <laughs> some gods and uh, creatures and Jungian slip. lightning bolts and stuff. Okay, sorry. Uh, methodology. But, but basically, from what I understood, one of the main ways they uh, came up with this number is they count on how often research papers and documents cited other research papers that came from the University of uh, Yagalone University, which they're. Like we talked about before this recording, it's not really a research uh, center in that sense. It's a, it's a university that teaches people careers and, you know, uh, and a uh, job. F- f- I think it's more of a liberal, what we call a liberal arts university, yeah, a research like the tradition, university. Exactly. And, you know, the main schools that are on top here, like MIT, Harvard, they have a lot of postgraduate uh, research programs going on. And they start basically just uh, citing and uh, pulling on the resources of other universities. So, of course, those universities will be top ranked if citations are your number one resource reason for ranking schools. I'd like this ranking to be more uh, based on the percentage of graduates, how many graduates find the job, how much they earn in their country respective to the potential earnings in that country. That would make more sense. Uh, and I think in that situation, uh, Uyots uh, would be higher up there because generally if you go to this university in Poland, you're more likely to get a job and more likely to get a decent paying job. So in that sense, you know, it's a, it's a good school. It's just on the international uh, academic kind of level. It's, it's not really a school that matters as much as some people might want it to. Josh? I have a question for you. Uh, either of you two gentlemen heard of a place called Quimbra? Quimbra, no. Yeah. Is that in the Harry Potter books somewhere? Uh, <laughs> a Quimbra is a medieval town in, in the south of Portugal, or no, the centre of Portugal, and it is home to the world's second oldest university, beaten only by Bologna, apparently. And the reason why I asked you if you'd heard of Quimbra, which I'd never heard of until I'd been there, is because in Portugal it is unbelievably famous and constantly being referred to as the world's second oldest university. You know what's hilarious? Uh, in most Polish history books, the ones that I was taught like when I was a kid, it would put down Jagiellonian University as the third oldest university in the world. Right. But it turns out it's the third oldest university if you take a certain definition of university into account. <laughs> and it's only actually true for like the central part of Europe. But even this university you're speaking of, I'm, I'm not really been sure if that, it's definitely the second university because there were, there were universities in some definition in the Middle East uh, back in like this, uh, you know, 700, 800 AD time frame. It really depends on what you mean by university and how you understand yeah, if it. If you yeah. count uh, uh, like, you know, church um, oriented places of learning where, you know, monks kind of transcribed um, you know, the various well, there is church that amusing documents thing and church in, texts and things in, like that. In Oxford, that, uh, you know, which is a collegiate system and you have the various colleges and one of the colleges is known as New College and New College was established in the 12th century. And I always think that kind of like knocks a lot of other the, these other wannabe old universities, you know, into a cocked hat. Well, it's anecdotal, I know, so it doesn't really prove anything. But just in my experience, talking with people from outside of Poland, of almost nobody, no, not almost nobody, but nobody has heard of Jagiellonian University before they're here and standing next to it, basically. This, it just doesn't have an international It is, it is the oldest Jagiellonian University in Krakow. It is, in fact. It? Yeah, yeah. It's true. I, again, anecdotally, I have the impression that Polish technical universities might have a higher profile in their respective fields. I think Polish technical universities have a very good reputation when it comes to, uh, you know, research and being on the cutting edge, especially modern technologies and things Robotics like Robotics and IT, yeah, exactly, definitely, like, sure. I'll get so high in Krakow. In their, again, specialized worlds, I think they have a very good profile, a very good reputation, but in the kind of the worldwide, global, you know, generic world of general education, uh, not so much. No, I, I, I think that's definitely the case. I, I can see that being the case. Well, uh, let's talk about alcohol, finally. <laughs> we've all finished off a couple of beers. This is something, we've been talking about this since the, the latter part of 2018, because there was an alcohol ban that was supposed to come into effect right around Christmas time, uh, about six months ago. <laughs> and for various legal reasons, it's been delayed and diluted, and, and, uh, but it's back in the news this week because apparently, Dr. Mike, some kind of progress, I guess you can call it progress, has been made on this front. Tell us what's going on with the alcohol ban. Well, yeah, the ban uh, went into effect, but then a, a somebody sued against it. it. There was an injunction, so it was t- uh, paused. 
so the city, while it's in the courts, decided to propose a program, uh, a voluntary program where uh, alcohol stores, uh, any place selling alcohol, not, we're not talking about bars, but you know where you can actually go buy a bottle of beer, uh, they can sign up to this program. And they will promise not to sell alcohol in in the uh, midnight to five thirty in the morning range, and this uh, and they will also set up say CCT cameras inside and outside the store, and the city, in uh, recognition of their efforts, will help them train their staff to deal with drunk or disorderly people, while also making sure that there are extra police and strasmeska. Uh, patrols in their regions to respond more quickly to you know situations with uh, drunk and disorderly individuals. It sounds or, like a worthless promise to me. It, it sounds like a worthless promise, but it's, uh, it's also suggesting that wait, wait. So other places that will sell alcohol and have bad security will not have uh, uh, s- uh, s- s- state-sponsored security yeah, police. So it sounds like the government is going to. They're threatening to withhold um, resources from yeah. places that do sell alcohol. And we by wouldn't the way, want anything to go wrong now, <laughs> would we? <laughs> nice shop you have here. <laughs> It would be a shame. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. Think about the hypocrisy here. The shops that are selling the alcohol, collecting these outrageous taxes for the government, they're the ones that are going to be denied public services uh, if they continue to, to sell alcohol. That's basically what it looks like. I, I mean, another side of the story here is that, say, the residents in that area will also, you know, be more likely to have it be quieter in the middle of the night and stuff like that. Because we're not, this is supposed to be in the center of town. It's, it's, uh, it's and Kajimis. and the, um, the centrum, yeah? Yes. And of course... Like, as well? I think. I'm not sure about Podgorza, but it's Kajimis, so like where we are right now in Stadamiasto. So there are other parts of town with like clubs and nightlife where it's not going to be all that quiet. But then, you know, you go two streets around the corner... And it's purely residential, except for that one store that sells, you know, booze all night. And you just have, like, people getting drunk, walking down the street, screaming and singing, buying us some bottles, yeah. drinking it outside, and residents just getting pissed off. And a lot of people, you know, want the ban to come into effect to stop that. So the whole idea here is that these places will stop selling alcohol and would also deal with the people that are being, you know, drunk and disorderly in public. Well, we'll see how it turns out. Uh, every reason to believe it's going to be stuck in the courts for some time, but we'll, um, maybe, maybe there'll be an actual ban one of these days. Who knows? We'll see. Well, we're going to finish this week uh, on a note kind of related to something we talked about a, around a month ago. Remember when we had the situation where these English guys, the stag party, uh, basically naked, wearing those um, Borat mankinis, hired a horse-drawn carriage in the Rennick, right? That was about oh, a month yeah. ago or so. Well, on the same subject of naked English asses, uh, a few days ago, a group of English guys, uh, no doubt uh, scholars, uh, you know, caught up in a disagreement over the uh, philosophical meaning of uh, various historical events, uh, decided to take their clothes off completely and jump in the river right in front of Vavel. Uh, the police were called. Uh, the guys were arrested and fined, uh, apparently 500 zwaris each. And uh, that seems to be the extent of their punishment. But uh, Josh, as our resident Englishman, can you please explain the phenomenon of English people somehow driven by the urge to get naked everywhere they go? Uh, <laughs> or they just want, were, they, were they discussing the viscosity of the water in, in the Visa or something like that? And they just wanted to like test their assumptions? <laughs> wanted to, um, they wanted to try out a hot Teutonic night. <laughs> um, I know. I, uh, well, I don't think all Englishmen... Um, behave like this, and in fact, I don't think it's. I don't no, think of course it, not. But when you hear a story about naked tourists jumping in the river, I would prefer. You know, it's an Englishman. You know, I, I've, I, no, and I, I think that's not entirely true. Actually, I think okay, we have 90% to be percent certain. No, no, no. Firstly, we have to a little, little bit of, of kind of, should we say, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, thing to do with the meanings of words and everything, like kind of like this, this conflation of English and British, and you know, person okay, from British, the fine. British Isles. Uh, some of the, some of the most notorious kind of clothes removers, in my experience, have been from uh, from from Ireland. In you fact, have a lot of experience in this subject. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? You like looking at the naked mitts, don't you? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm I'm speaking of reputation rather than you know first hand experience. Come on, we all know that again. If you hear a story about naked, you know, tourists doing stupid things, you, you know they're not from uh, they're not from Portugal, Germany. <laughs> they're not from Germany. Oh, Germans, they're they, they're sober and they get they're naked. They're not from Canada. They are from the UK, and if they're not from the UK, they're from Ireland for sure. I don't know. I just, what, I just don't get the naked thing. Uh, I don't know. Well, you go to Finland and they're all doing it in the winter, which is even more uh, bizarre. Maybe that's it? true. It's more culturally accepted there, and they do it when they're sober and you know in spas and. Are sounds. you sure they're sober? I think the Finns really really tuck it away, actually. 
<laughs> well, well, if you're, uh, if you're, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna let that go. <laughs> if well, he doesn't just shrink, shrivel up, uh, and this, this seems to be like the kind of thing. The water was cold. <laughs> this, this is the kind of thing that happens in in bunches of three, and so I fully expect in the next couple of weeks to have a completing, uh, you know, complete the trilogy of English naked English ass here. But we'll see how it goes. Well, speaking of English, I don't know how, how do I how do I finish things after talking about naked English guys? I have no idea. Well, that's everything you need to know this week. Well, I just want to mention one well, thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I didn't have yeah. anything to mention. I just had to interject. <laughs> Wouldn't be a proper ending if somebody didn't try to interrupt me before I brought it to a close. Thanks for listening, everybody. Make sure to give us a like, share us on Facebook, send us a message, tell us what you think about the show, and uh, we'll see you next time on the news. 